Okay, Dale Dye, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brett. I appreciate your time. So you have a really interesting resume. You started off, you're a Marine vet, served in Vietnam, got into showbiz, and we'll talk a bit about that, author as well, have done some acting too. So let's start from the beginning, your, your military career. You served in the, the Marines. You, you retired as a captain. Did you start off as a commissioned arf- officer, or is that something you worked your way up to? No, I'm, I'm what's known in the Navy and the Marine Corps as a Mustang. I, uh, I came up through the ranks. I uh, was 13 years enlisted, uh, made it to the rank of uh, Master Sergeant, and then was kind of coerced by some folks who thought I might make a leader into uh, going to officer candidate school. I became a warrant officer and later converted my commission. And by the time of my uh, my last uh, combat deployment, which was Beirut, 82, 83, I had become a captain. So uh, I kind of came up through the hawse pipe. Right. And uh, it's, it's interesting. I've heard, I've heard other interviews, and you've done a TEDx talk, talking about as a leader in the military, you feel sometimes feel like you're, you're raising other people's children. Why, why is that? Well, I think the truthful answer is that a lot of parents don't do such a good job at that. And um, they send their young sons or daughters off into the military, or their young sons and daughters decide to go into the military looking for something, looking for some structure, looking for some guidance, looking for images and examples that they sort of want to grow up into being. And I've always thought that one of the greatest and most significant tasks of a leader is to provide those images, to provide that guidance, to provide that leadership, not only in military aspects of life, but just who you are and how you address life and how you handle problems and how you stand up to adversity. And I think, I think that's one of the key elements of leadership. And, and I've always shorthanded it by saying, um, I spent a lot of my life raising other people's children. Right. And as a leader, so you, you said that other people thought you'd be a good leader when you were in the military, was leadership something you aspired to, or were you just you were just there to do the work? And if you got put in a leadership position, then great. No, I I think I have to say honestly that I aspired to be a leader. I was influenced by so many um, that I saw that were my images, the images I needed, and I wanted to be that person. I felt like I had the the talent to do it, the ability to do it the personality to pull it off. And I thought at first, early on, well, let me test this. Let me dip my toe in the water. And when I became a corporal, you know, was I good at that or did I just suck at it? And uh, and I should, you know, go back to just being a job guy. And what I discovered was that it was a great joy. It was, it was fun to be a good leader. And was leadership something you felt, okay, you said that you had a natural knack for it, but did you have to learn how to be a leader? Like, did you have to be intentional about being a good leader? No, Lord, yes. I I wish it were true, Brett, that leaders are born, but they're not, and they never will be, I don't think. There are certain people who, who gravitate to it, who are good at it. I think I'm one of those. But you have to learn the steps. You have to, and and very often, at least in my case, you learn by screwing it up. You learn what things are wrong. You learn people. And I think that's the most crucial element of it. You have to understand people. I've, I've often said and still say that you have to love them to lead them. People in the military in particular have a very, very high, highly sophisticated BS filter. They know when you're being true and when you're being faithful and we're just putting on an act. And, and I understood that. I learned that, that you can't just go out and be the, you know, the Bonham nice guy. You have to have that principle of loving and caring about the people under your charge. And, and if you can do that and, and the sentiment is sincere, the psychology is there, then you'll develop the tools that you need to get the job done. Were you uh, intentional about reading books on leadership, or was you were you more of a I'm going to gain I'm going to gain my knowledge of leadership by experience? I, I think it went both ways, Brad. I think like all professional military people, I'm an amateur historian. I'm I'm sitting in my library right now, uh, surrounded by about 1,100 volumes, and I've read every one of them. You you can learn so much by reading about 
the great leaders. And this goes all the way back. I mean, Caesar's Gallic Wars was one of the first things I read about leadership. So it it goes throughout our military history. And I focused on on military aspects. Uh, Some other people focus on political or business aspects, but my focus was on the military. So I read these these biographies and I read the books about the battles and the actions and the leader's role in them. And then I began to sort of carve it down, sort of focus it into what what did these people that I'm I'm reading about have? What what did they demonstrate? Bad and good. And uh, and so once once I had a few of those concepts in mind, concepts that I had gotten through my reading, I began to experiment with them, I began to try to be this guy or try to do what that guy did. And some was good, some was bad, some was situational, but all of it was instructive. All of it was giving me, uh, was sharpening the tools I needed to be a good leader. So uh, there's a one military historian that I that I've come across. His name is John Keegan. He wrote a book called The Mask of Command. And his whole yes, argument he is, did. Yeah. And his whole argument is that when you're a leader, you you have to put on, sometimes you got you to put on this mask that you aren't necessarily want to put on, right? But you have to do it to get the job done. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I do. And, but I, I, I don't think, I think it's painting with too broad a brush. Uh, I love Keegan's work, and and the Mask of Command is was one of is I can reach out and touch it right now. It's it's one of the books I read regularly. But here's here's my experience when I was growing up and and studying leaders by looking at them. Uh, I was convinced at at an, a young age that these guys weren't real people. They were automatons. They were they were something that was carved out of solid granite somewhere along in their history. And they didn't have a human side. So I, I, I went that way. And as I began to look and as I began to study and as I began to know these people, I discovered that yeah, they're human. They're people just like me. And they have the same concerns and they have the same fears. They have the same irritants. They have the same things that make them smile and make them happy. Well, that was a that was a major revelation. And then along came Keegan and the mask of command. And I said, aha, I see. They are putting on this mask of command. Now, the the thing that I think makes Keegan's estimation too broad a brush is that there are so many different masks of command. And you have to you have to change your mask. It can't be one thing that you pull down over your face and now I'm Dale the leader. It's you've got to you've got to know what mask to put on that will work in a specific situation. Let me see if I can give you an example. The the mask that you put on in a firefight when it's up to you to maneuver, when it's up to you to get people out and maneuvering and, and moving under fire is one thing. The mask that you need to put on when you are dealing with an individual who has uh, made a mistake or who has screwed up and is and needs some discipline and you want to do that one on one, you know, praise in public and criticize in in private. That's a different mask. And so the good leader learns to have a bunch of those masks in his rucksack, a bunch of those masks in his pocket. And he can pull out the one that's required. Now, granted, as Keegan points out, they all have common denominators. There's a commonality between all of the masks. But I think the really good leader, the one who can be relied on in all situations, has many masks of leadership at his command. And and how do you learn to put on? You know, how do you learn to collect those masks and put them on in the right circumstance? Well, that's the hard part. You learn that the first element is to learn that different masks are needed. Once you've done that, you've got to go about trying to develop different masks. And you do that through study. You do that through trial and error. You do that by watching other people succeed or screw up. And you say, well, that's that's mask that that guy is wearing won't work. That sucks like a Hoover vacuum cleaner. There's no way I'm going to do that. So that all of that experience shapes your masks. And then the key is to know when to put them on. And that 
many times depends not only on the situation, but on the individual. You see, leadership is, is not only about influencing people to do your will and accomplish a mission. It's about knowing who those people are and what they require for you to make them want to do your will. Right. And I think it also do, it's, it, you're also trying to convince yourself, right, as a leader. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest mask is the one that you wear when you're looking in the mirror. Right. I, I remember, this, this may sound dramatic, but it's true, so I'm just going to relate it to you. On the, on the day at Quantico, Virginia, on the day that I had been through officer candidate school and I'd been through the basic school and I was going to get commissioned, I remember that morning getting up and getting my dress uniform ready to go down and fall, fall in the formation and be commissioned along with all the other candidates. And um, I look, I was shaving and I looked myself in the mirror and I said, you know, when the day comes that you can't look your people in the eye and say, follow me, it is necessary that we die. When that day comes, it's the day you're not leading anymore and you should quit. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. So it's interesting about your career. So you, you served in the Marines in Vietnam. You served in Beirut last. But then after your military service, you got started working in Hollywood. And what you did is you started a, con- a consulting company to show filmmakers on how to make war movies more realistic. So I'm curious, what were wrong, what was wrong with Hollywood war movies that you thought that there, there needed to be a better way? Well, I, I'll, I'll redirect your question for a moment to say that a lot of what I've accomplished uh, in motion pictures and television entertainment industry is because when you're ignorant, you can do a lot of things people tell you you can't do. And that was that was certainly my case. When when I retired, um, I milled around doing several things and trying to decide what it was that I really wanted to do. What what could I bring to the table? And there was all the standard stuff, you know, go be a, a security specialist or go be a cop. But I'd been shot too many times to, you know, want to work on the mean streets carrying a weapon. And so I, I began to, you know, a, a great period of self-interest, of, of introspection. And um, the the thing that just jumped out at me was that you're a movie fan, Di. I mean, you've seen practically every military movie there is. And I think that was true at the time. And the common denominator there was that they all pissed me off, or most of them pissed me off. They just weren't who we, they weren't a representation in the popular media, which I knew has huge influence on societies. Movies and television have a huge influence on societies. And I said, here we are being represented as soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen in those popular media. And it's wrong. We, we don't act that way. We don't do that kind of thing. And wouldn't it be more exciting and more insightful and more educational in this vastly popular media if we were depicted correctly, warts and all? And so that's when the, the bulb began to glow dimly over my head. And I said, you know, what's, what's wrong here? And I began to see, I began to watch credits roll. And I would see Captain Jimmy Umtafratz, U.S. Army retired, in the end credits. And he was listed as the military technical advisor. And I said, well, what's wrong with that guy? How does he let him get away with this stuff? And so I decided to come to Hollywood. And as I said, when you're ignorant, you just do things. And I I began to try to investigate. I began to look around and I began to, what, why are we depicted so badly? Why can't we get it right? And what I discovered essentially was a, was a what I call hubris on the part of Hollywood. There was an opinion that, and this was post-Vietnam, so a lot of that shadow still hung over public opinion. What I discovered was that producers and directors and writers simply had no knowledge, very, very few of them. In fact, you could probably count them on one hand. It had any military experience whatsoever. And what they did have was kind of a negative experience because of the period they may or may not have served. So I said, well, there's the problem. They don't understand, or if they're being told something, they have absolutely no inclination to listen to it or pay attention to it. That's why 
they get these guys in as military advisors and then they, you know, pay them five hundred dollars a week and have them sit in a chair and they wake them up when they want to know which side the ribbons go on. But they don't get into who we are, how we act, how we react, how we relate to each other. And I said, well, there's the problem. Someone's got to teach them. And I fell back, put my leader mask on. And I said, well, the key here is training. We've got to take these young actors and we've got to put them in our shoes, make them walk the mile that we've walked in our combat boots. And if we can do that, they'll get an insight. They'll get they'll get a, a close and personal look at who we are and how we act and how we relate to each other. And that can't help but improve the performances. So that was my theory. <clears throat> and I began to try to sell it to Hollywood. Well, that was um, to to understate the case. That was a an uphill battle. I mean, I, I talked to people and I said, look, I have a better way to make war movies. I'm worth more to you than telling you which uniform is right and telling you that you shouldn't carry an M-16 in World War II. I've, I've got more to bring to table here. I can help you train these actors and you'll get brilliant performances. And of course, essentially what the attitude was, was look, two things. The first is we've made war movies for years and made zillions of dollars. And, and why should we pay you money to change what we think works? That was attitude one. Attitude two was, look, you spent most of your life in the military. So automatically, by definition, you can't be creative. You can't understand drama. You can't understand how movies are made. You can't understand these things. And I knew that was false. I knew that was wrong. I did understand. And I, you know, I wasn't a great dramatist or a great writer at the time, but I knew what was right and what was wrong. And I knew that human beings can correct things. And so it was, it was a real fight, Brett. And I, I was, frankly, after about a year, I was about to give it up. I was running out of money and running out of patience. And an interesting thing happened. I saw a little notice I had learned by this time to read the trade papers, Daily Variety and Hollywood Reporter and that sort of thing. And I saw a little notice that said that a heretofore relatively unknown writer director by the name of Oliver Stone was going to do a movie about Vietnam based on his own experience as a combat infantryman in Vietnam. And I said, look, if I can get to this guy, he'll understand it. And I went through a, a series of machinations, uh, talking to writers, and I was in, I was desperate to find a way to get to this guy where I could get by the gatekeepers and the agents and the representatives and the managers and all the other nonsense that surrounds celebrities. And uh, I was I was able to actually get Stone's home phone number. And uh, I that was a Saturday night and I, Sunday morning I called him. And I pitched him. I, I did my best two minute drill, you know, and had it been anybody else, he probably would have hung up and had me arrested. But but Stone said, well, that's interesting. Let's talk. And we did. I explained what I thought was wrong with uh, war movies and how the performances could be improved based on training like he and I had had as soldiers and Marines. And he, he bought it. And uh, the the shortest part of a long story is he gave me 33 actors, some of whom, and none of whom were, were big names then, but are now. He gave me Johnny Depp and Charlie Sheen and Tom Berenger and uh, Willem Dafoe, Forrest Whitaker, and a bunch of others. And I, I took them into the jungles of the Philippines where they lived with me for three weeks and they humped and they fought and they sweated and they strained just like we did in Vietnam. And at the end of that period, when I brought them down out of the jungle, they were who Oliver and I were when we were 19 in combat. And we made this little movie called Platoon, brought it home, and lo and behold, it won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And Oliver was kind enough to recognize me as having been a big part of that great film. And um, at that point, all of those people who were throwing me out of their offices began to call. And I said, look, we think you may have had a point there. Will you come and work on this film and that film? And now it's been 50 some film and television projects uh, since that time. And uh, and I continue to uh, wear the mask of the leader and I continue to improve on my method. And and it has um, 
it has grown and blossomed kind of like Topsy. And I think I think it will continue because I've taught a lot of people how to do this. And, you know, I'm I'm very serious about getting current veterans involved in it and showing them how to do it, using their experience uh, in the creative endeavors. And it seems to be I'm, I seem to be getting a little traction after 25 or 30 years. Well, that's really interesting. And when these guys go through the boot camp, do like they do they does the way they carry themselves change? Like they actually carry themselves like a soldier? Absolutely. And it's that that I pay attention to. You see, you can you can train practically anybody to walk and talk and carry the weapon and wear the gear and look like he knows what he's doing. But you you need to get into his heart and into his guts and into his mind so that he understands that, so that he retains the experience and the experience changes him. And it really does. I mean, one of the one of the most rewarding things in the world to me is after a certain period of time in the training, I see these changes. Once again, I'm raising other people's children and I see them change. And I see them carry themselves differently. Most importantly, I see them relate to each other differently. They have learned through that experience that despite their, their previous opinion, the sun does not rise and set on their ass. I mean, the world is not all about them and what swirls around them. They learn that they're part of a team and that they must rely on the guy next to them. And the guy next to them must be able to rely on them. And that's a profound change, especially in young actors. It sounds like you're teaching these guys how to put on masks as well in order to, to do the role. I mean, it's the same thing you're doing with soldiers you're doing to these actors. Yes, I, th- I think that's exactly right. And that was the success of my method. There was, up until I started it, uh, there was an opinion that, well, look, it's acting. We don't need all that in-depth understanding. Well, I knew that was false. That was nonsense. That was BS. They do need that understanding in order to bring that sort of thing to their performance on screen. And it turned out I was correct and they weren't, which is, which is a gratifying thing at this point. Besides Platoon, what other films have you consulted on? Oh, uh, <clears throat> so many of them. It, it, would, it would take all of our time to talk about it. But, I, but for instance... Born on the 4th of July, Band of Brothers, The Pacific, Saving Private Ryan, and, and many of them that aren't that high profile, but, uh, but I do them regularly. Right. No, the classics. Yeah, the new classics. I'm curious, are there any pre-Dale Dye war movies that you think are actually good? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I love the, the little efforts that were, that were made by guys who, who actually were veterans. I love Sam Fuller's Steel Helmet. A little two hundred and fifty thousand dollar Korean War movie. That's a, that's a tour de force about leadership and and small unit integrity. I love the Bridges of Tokori. I think they got that one right. And there there are a bunch of them. But that said, there are fewer in the old method than there are now in the new method. Right. Well, and besides consulting, you've actually you know consulting behind the camera, you've actually starred in movies as well. So what movies can we find Dale Dye in? Well, you, uh, a bunch of them, I guess. It's, it's interesting. And it was Oliver Stone to blame for all of this. He saw me training and he said, you know, you need to play the company commander in platoon, Captain Harris. And I said, really? And he said, I, said, I don't know anything about acting. And he said, you're a natural, just be you. And I did, and, and the interesting thing about it was that critics actually kind of singled me out and said, whoever that guy is, uh, he was really convincing. And that kind of led to uh, other parts. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been in, oh, it's got to be 20 or 30 films. I'm usually the guy who shows up and explains the Jeopardy in military terms and then goes away. And then in Act 3, I come in and congratulate everybody on how well they did or pin a few medals. Right. On. You, you can find me in, in Saving Private Ryan. You can find me as uh, Colonel Sink in uh, Band of Brothers. And a bunch of performances. One of my, I loved, I love to play real people, so that I can do the research and I can dig in on the character. And that's what I did with Colonel Sink 
the CEO of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment in, in Band of Brothers. And I, I loved playing General Leonard Wood to Tom Berenger's Teddy Roosevelt in uh, The Rough Riders, uh, which was a TNT, made for made for television TNT movie. And I don't know, I, I don't want to sit here and, and read my resume. Right, but. right. No, it's impressive. It's, it's amazing. I think it's a good example of not pigeonholing yourself and looking at the experience you have and, and seeing the different places you can go with it. Well, I have a, I have a real low tolerance for boredom, and I've always been that way. If I, I, I'm always wanting to do something or, or I'll see something that sparks my interest and I say, you know, maybe I could do that. And I'll jump over and try that. Acting was that way and, and worked out terrifically. But writing, uh, I've always been a storyteller and, and I love telling stories. I love entertaining. And uh, I decided, you know, uh, I'm pretty facile with the English language. Maybe I should write this stuff down. And I did. Uh, and I think at this point I've published about 13 novels, 12 or 13 of them. And they've, they've gotten great interest. They're all military books, of course. I write what I know. But they, they have been really popular. They've, they've jumped out. I, uh, they were so popular, in fact, that what I did was I started, uh, my company is called Warriors Incorporated. And so I branched an effort off. And we now have what's called Warriors Publishing Group. And we've got I don't know, 24 or 25 titles out there, very, very high profile titles. We've, uh, we're publishing John Del Vecchio's 13th Valley and, and a number of uh, really great books. And that's, that's worked out fine. I'm now branched off into writing films and directing them. This year, I hope to start uh, my, first, my first feature directorial effort, a World War II film called No Better Place to Die, which essentially will be the airborne version of Saving Private Ryan, where Ryan focused on the, the beach assaults, the surface assaults. And my story focuses on the airborne assault, the people who jumped in before the beach, uh, beach assaults started. And it's, it's going great. Tom Hanks is executive producing it for me. And, uh, and so I think we're going to shoot that film this summer. So uh, who knows? Who knows what's right, next? No. I have no idea. It sounds crazy. And so you're going to do the the military training. So you're gonna, like, how does that go? So it's three weeks a month. How long do you usually have those guys? It it all depends on how much the the producers of the film will give me. What I ask for is a minimum of two weeks, because it the method really Captain Dye's method, if you will, is full immersion, and I have to do in two weeks what normally takes 10 weeks or 12 weeks in basic training. So I have to eliminate a lot of things and I have to focus hard on a few other things and we have to work 24 hours around the clock. It's, it's very hard, very intense, very difficult. But I have done it in as short as a week. The, the longer they're willing to give me uh, in what they, they euphemistically term rehearsal time, the longer they're willing to give me, the better the result. And that's what I usually say. I said, look, you can, you can say I've got three days and I'll do what I can. But if you really want this to sing, if you really want these guys to come out of there knowing the characters and able to portray them beautifully, you need to give me more time. And, and it's always a negotiation and always an argument. Do you shave their heads like when they come in like boot camp? It depends. Right. Uh, if that's required, yes, absolutely I do. And that's always a, a, a source of much... Uh, crying and pissing and moaning. <laughs> but if, if it's required, then absolutely I do. If it's not required, <clears throat> I make them get that standard haircut that for the day and the period and the time, and that's where we go. So yeah, it sounds like you know the way, the way you become something is you have to act it out. Like you have to do it. There's all this talk about being inauthentic, right? But sometimes that's what you have to do to become that thing you want to be. Sometimes you have to act it out. And then eventually by acting it out, you become what you want to be. Look, it's, that's, that's right, Brett. And, it, and it's, you know, it's not brain surgery. If I can sit and talk to you all day long about what a cookie tastes like, and I can be the world's greatest descriptor and storyteller about that cookie. And you're going to sit there and you're going to say, okay, I, I understand all about that cookie, but nothing, nothing is going to let you relate what that cookie is about until you've bitten into it. And that's the theory. That's the theory. Well, Dale, this has been a great conversation, but where can people go to learn more about your work? 
Well, uh, I'm I'm all over the internet, despite the fact that I don't want to be. I am. You can look up Warriors Incorporated on the internet. You can look up No Better Place to Die, which is the name of my new film. It's all over Facebook. You can read my books. They're all available at Amazon. And uh, look up Warriors Incorporated. We've got a terrific website that'll tell you who we are, what we are, and what we're trying to do. And that that's, that's very simple, Brett. There's one agenda. I want to, through my efforts in the popular media, all of the popular media, I want to shine some long overdue light on the men and women who've worn our military uniform and whose service and sacrifice so much for us every day. Well, that's a great mission. Dale Dye, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Brett, my pleasure. Thanks very much. We'll do this again when we can. My guest today was Dale Dye. He's the owner of Warriors, Inc. You can find more information about his work at daledye.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash daledye. That's D-Y-E, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.